Hey, folks, we are back at it again. It's Lindsay Huddleston with SPS. That's right, Sports Psychology Solutions. You're here at the SPS Edge podcast with a great team. I got my guy, Terry McCord Jr., representing, and we got John and Patrick Rutherford. And uh, the face you don't see, but is definitely here with us, is Mr. Orlando Watkins making it happen. But we're back for another one, another great lineup of topics, and uh, I couldn't be with a better group of people uh, to do this. Uh, it's amazing how we've taken advantage of technology and been able to do this virtually, but I can only imagine the trouble we would cause if we were all in the same room uh, with the ability to leave and go somewhere afterwards. I can only imagine. And, and John, I'm pointing at you as the number one tr troublemaker, uh, the Pied <laughs> Piper. You're gonna say, follow me, let's go. I got a spot we can go to. Is that right, John? That's how it's gonna be? Yeah, I, 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 yeah 10 years ago, you would have been in trouble, not now. <laughs> <laughs> 10 years ago, all right, that's cool. I uh, want to also shout out uh, Horatio Williams and Horatio Williams Foundation, our great sponsor, supporting us along with Gilead uh, Sciences as well as Dick Sporting Good. And also shout out to the Streets Are Talking Podcast Network, my guy Don Houston, as well as Clarence Babor. And with no further ado, Terry, let's talk about the SWAC. SWAC, SWAC, SWAC. The SWAC update, that's right. Coach Prime is going to be hosting a satellite camp. And those of us with these Michigan ties, particularly – Southeast Michigan, Detroit in particular, we do know about what those satellite camps look like. Uh, we know Coach Harbaugh at Michigan has some satellite camps going on, but let's give give it up to Sound Body, Sound, uh, Sound Body, Sound, sound Mind, sound, sound Body. Thank you, Sound Mind, Sound Body. I didn't have a Sound Mind, Sound Body trying to say that. Thank you, Patrick. Uh, and shout out those guys for what they did over several years. Uh, and I had the uh, opportunity to attend one of their camps several years ago at Wayne State. So I understand what that concept is like. And I, I'll give a brief uh, uh, reference to the tweet that Coach uh, Prime put out more so to Instagram. He said, calling the all dogs. We want to see you live, baby. That's my primetime voice. This is my first college camp with uh, uh, Jackson State. And I expect the best talent from all over. This is a satellite camp and there will be many schools on hand that can offer you a scholarship on the spot. Uh, I know I am. I know I, I am, and I got you. Uh, more details will come, uh, but this is the one that you and your parents better not procrastinate about. All HBCUs, you are personally invited from me, Coach Prime, all local businesses. Uh, let's put together on this one and do what we uh, need to be, uh, do what we hadn't, what hadn't been done, excuse me. Let's give all the visitors a true Jackson State, Mississippi experience. Of professionalism and hospitality. And he goes on to tag uh, Jackson State Tigers, Under Armour, uh, Pepsi, Gatorade, uh, Bar Stools, uh, and a number of other places. I'll start with Terry, then I'll get to the Rutherford men. Uh, Terry, how cool do you think this opportunity is that Coach Prime is leveraging his celebrity uh, to bring in something like a uh, satellite camp? If you had those experiences just as I had with those, what do you think about this? You know, satellite camps are, you know, they can be a great thing, they can be a bad thing. Uh, it depends on your mindset coming in. People will be fighting over spots. I mean, personally, upperclassmen, seniors, you know, I'm there as a freshman, try to step over you, try to take your spot. You know, if you're not paying attention, if you don't want to do it, they take it over you. You can't be there in, in fear. You got to be there. Them guys is hungry. Them guys is hungry, man. You got to be there to compete, you know. So, I mean, one thing I like, another thing I like about satellite camps, you know, other than competing is that these schools get a chance to reach some guys that they typically wouldn't meet. I mean, I, uh, a couple like Michigan schools, Michigan high schools typically don't get recruited by HBCUs. So, I mean, they just have, they're not in their region. I mean, they don't have access to them or those schools don't have the same recruiting access as they would, you know, for a power five or a mid major. So I think it'd be really cool for like a guy from Maine to get a, uh, get a scholarship from Jackson state just because he's down there and he's hungry. So I really hope it's organized. It, it, it you know, it is, you know, it's done well. Um, it gives Jackson State to put themselves on, and, they, and I'm definitely sure they're going to make some money off of this camp, and they can go to, you know, new equipment that Prime's been talking about, new facilities, you know, more than what they have coming in. So I be, it's a great thing for them to kind of get that attention and some guys that they may not usually see, you know, to get some pub and get a scholarship. Yeah, absolutely right. I want to go to uh, John and Patrick, and before I do, I remember being at uh, Sound Body, Sound Mind camp uh, years ago, and uh, this is at the time I was building a relationship with Coach Harbaugh at Michigan, of course. And I remember being there on the field with them, seeing Coach uh, Kelly from Notre Dame walk by. They had just came in on the PJ, the private jet. Urban Meyer was there. 
uh, super standoffs, but I forced them into a conversation. That's another discussion. But what was interesting, though, uh, I remember to your point, Terry, about having to compete. There was a kid they were looking at for quarterback, and he was playing catch with Harbaugh. And the kid kept dropping the ball. So I was talking to her, but I said, man, what's up with him? Is he nervous? He's like, man, you can't be nervous now. So to your point, man, these are these opportunities that you may get. So my question to you, Patrick, as well as John is, you know, what does it say about Coach Prime? Because he could have easily had this whole thing, but said for Jackson State. For him to open it up to all coaches and kind of show that love when, let's be honest, he really didn't have to. But by doing this, is this the whole idea of, uh, you know, rising tide raises all ships? What do you think, uh, John? Well, I, w I expect no less from a superstar like Deion Sanders. Mm -hmm. uh, he's doing the right thing. Uh, don't talk about the movement. Be the movement is what don't he said. About it, be about it. What right. he said last week when he got a, a, a transfer from Georgia Tech. And, you know, it's nice to see him take the lead and include other people in it. Uh, I expect no less from him. He, listen, Deion Sanders wasn't just a superstar because he had great feet and great, great instincts. Let's face it, th this man is a personality. He, 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 he is... He is known for subway commercials to uh, doing a dance after he makes a uh, inter interception. Yeah. This is this is an icon in American pop cult, pop culture, and I expect nothing less from him. And I am so proud of what and how he's conducting business right now. Man, I'll tell you what. There's not a day goes by that I don't look up to the sky and say, watch over that man and take care of him because he is a leader. Yes. He's out front, baby. Yeah. And and when you're when you got enough to go out front, man, you gotta take your head up and tip your cap to a guy yeah. like him out. Right. Uh, listen, man, he 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 ain't called prime time because he's slow. Yeah, for sure. You know, Patrick, I definitely want to get your thoughts, but also when you talk about the idea of the Marshall Fox, if I'm right, uh, the Eddie George is taking over programs and them leveraging this star power. Can you only imagine what two, three, five years from now it's going to look like, especially with these HBCUs and not at these corporate dollars? Because right now, who has the advantage? Pepsi has the advantage right now. Uh, Gatorade falls under Pepsi. I get that, if I'm correct. Uh, uh, yeah. Under Armour has the advantage because they're kind of getting in first. And you know how that goes. You know, love those that love you. But what do you think overall about this move uh, that Primetime is making, uh, especially that he's opening up to so many other people instead of just keeping it Jackson State uh, affiliated? Um, first of all, I'd like to shout out the SBS Edge Nike drip over there. Okay, okay, we keep okay. we keep we over there. A merch line going over there. Oh yeah, hey, hey, hey. I, I got to get a couple um, orders going in a minute. I got to get some sizes done. All right, no problem. Absolutely. Love it. Absolutely. <laughs> every every channel's good with a merch line. Um, yes, sir. But, we got to make a note. Uh, I think that it does nothing but um, grow the swag or grow their whole their whole conference. You know, and you can't really say it much better than what my dad said, but. You know, like with Marshall Falk coming in to your point of seeing it from three to five years from now, like I would only hope we can go with what my dad said last week of he hopes to see one day before he passes away uh, Jackson State versus Florida State in the Sugar Bowl. I think that Ooh. we're hoping towards that literally coming true. And I, I only hope that it happens because we all know that um, they don't like stadium – Ticket sales is great, but everybody knows what makes a conference is the TV TV deals. Yeah. So yeah. If, if they can grow their TV deals and actually, like, to your point, say, grow, grow the corporate dollars, then they will be able to pay for summer school. They will be able to pay uh, for these facilities that are like pro facilities on the college campus. You know, they will, they will have the same things to offer as the Big Ten or the Big 12 or the SEC. And that's truly what I would like to see, uh, even playing field. 
Yeah, I like that. I think, um, you know, we talked about this before, especially when you talk about corporate America and how everyone is kind of basically, for lack of a better term, moving scared. But in this particular case, Prime is uh, leveraging and people are watching. And I think what people are doing already saying, all right, what are we going to do for next year? But uh, again, my hat off to him. I think it's a great thing. My concern, and I hate to have this conspiracy theory thing, man, is that I project, man, in five to 10 years, the power that these HBCUs are going to have again is going to lead to just some people saying, man, what's going on? It's like, you know, that line from Malcolm X, that's too much power for one conference to have. It's kind of like, you know, whether it's a bidding war, and I think that's a good thing. But also, lastly, uh, don't worry, John, you will see it because you ain't going nowhere. We ain't going to let nothing happen to you. You ain't going nowhere. You're going to be around. Uh, and that, that's our word. We got to keep you rocking with us on that. So very Absolutely. good. We, ha we have to keep an eye on that. I think the date for that is, uh, I want to say, June uh, 19th. All right. Oh, y'all didn't peep that. That's Please June 10th. Absolutely. June 19th. So I see what he's doing. I see the message in that. Okay. I see you, Dion. Juneteenth. Okay. All right. It's something to be said about that freedom. Very good. So speaking of that, I think a great transition we can have is to our next topic. And, you know, when I watch the news or watch sports, and shout out to Uncle Shay Shay uh, and his program, because, you know, it is what it is. You know, you see these programs, they kind of tip the hat on what the week is going to be talking about sports-wise. But, man, I was seeing this thing about Tim Tebow coming back. And, and and as as pro black and you know Afrocentric as I am and all that, I don't lead with that in my mind. I don't make that the issue. But I'm like, wait a minute, dude. Why are we even talk about Timothy Tebow coming back to the NFL to play a uh, 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 tight end? Now, I, now what I don't want to do with all these great sports minds right here, I don't want to uh, overly influence any discussion because I know you guys got your own opinion. But it's just really hard for me to understand. Is there a conspiracy to keep Tim Tebow employed? Like nothing against the dude, but why does this name keep coming up? And why is this even discussion? The last thing I'll say, someone made a good point. If he's going to be in there to be a locker room guy, to be a leader, to be able to help, I get that. But just give him a damn coaching job. But to say he's still going to play, and of course, and I'll start with you, Terry, before I go to the Rutherfords, you know, the first thing that came up, and I wasn't trying to bring this up, but it just came up. Well, what's up with Cap? You got Tebow can be discussed at nauseum about different jobs. And, hell, he didn't did everything but play hockey for the most part. And <laughs> now we still dealing with the same thing with Cap. So I'll go to Terry and then uh, to John and Patrick. I'll let them decide who's going to go first. But, Terry, what do you think about this? Basically, the question I pose is the Tim Tebow back to the NFL criticism warranted? Uh, I, I would say, you know what, honestly, I, I would say it's not. But it, but it is. I feel like it is. It's not warranted, but it's directed towards the wrong person or people. And so I say that because um, Tim P, Tim Tebow, excuse me, was uh, was a part of that position change um, conversation when he had that rough rough outing in Denver. People were asking Tim Tebow, "Would would you be willing to try out as a tight end?" I think the Patriots were a team in mind, and they were asking him, "Would you do you want to play?" And Tim was like, "No, I'm a quarterback. I want to be in this league to be a quarterback." Then get signed, chooses to play baseball. So everyone knew like Tim Tebow could play a different position, but he was solely sold on playing quarterback. And so, you know, Urban Meyer is, you know, like a dad to him, like he's like a second father, you know. And so I do think that, you know, a little bit of uh, nepotism did come to play where he brought his boy back, you know, which, you know, is expected, you know, at that high level you, you put on for your people. But I think this attention towards Tebow should have been directed like years ago, we can even say last year to the whole situation where the Chicago Bears, uh, Falcons, our own Detroit Lions, um, you know, the Denver Broncos. I mean, different teams who have had quarterback problems. That that's where it isn't that, that that's where it seems like it, the issue needs to be pressed on. Like, there's no reason why Trubisky isn't really getting. He he does get critiqued. But there's no reason why they're not looking for another replacement immediately while Kaepernick's still available. I mean, th th that's where I feel like, you know, even the Jets. I mean, m m there, there are a lot of teams that have those quarterback issues where Kaepernick could be a little a short time or short term solution. You know, just give him a chance or even sign him as a backup. You know what I mean? So I feel like, you know, the, the attack on Tebow doesn't it seems like more of a just something to kind of jump on. You know what I mean? I feel like it's well it's it's well overdue and it's finally out here, but I don't think Tebow really deserves all that heat 
just because there are a lot of other factors and perspectives in that. I appreciate that, Terry, and I appreciate you bringing that and also bringing somewhat of a level-headed response. Because like I said, I don't consider myself the greatest sports mind. I didn't initially go there about Kaepernick. I kind of blocked that a little bit, but then immediately a lot of players start bringing that up. So it's almost like I think what this was was a red meat type issue is that red meat that's hanging in the jungle and the cat, you know, a, a lion is coming. Like, oh, I'm going to get that. That's easy pickings. So I defer to uh, John and Patrick. You guys can decide who wants to lead off. But again, I pose the same question uh, that I posed to Terry. Do you think that the criticism is warranted uh, against Tim Tebow? Um, the criticism warranted, I guess it would just be a um, your own opinion type of thing. I'm leaning on the fence 50-50, you know, uh, you know, like. Okay, you know, let me ask you this. Let me ask you this because uh, you can handle the pressure. Uh, <laughs> congratulations, Patrick, for becoming the general manager for the Jacksonville Jaguars. Uh, you got to put this roster together, man. Um, you in the press conference. And SBS is there interviewing, like, what made Tim Tebow stand out to where he is somebody you think is worth pursuing over all these other players in that position that may have more recent time playing, Mr. Rutherford? Yeah. Do you know who their tight end is? Uh, I can't say exactly, but I think there was, there was three to four, maybe even four to five other guys competing for that position. Their starting, their starting tight end on the roster right now has caught 12 passes in the last six years of his career. <laughs> okay. Okay, very good. That's why you're the general manager. Let's, not, let's let's like um Michael Vick and Shannon Sharp said the other day, you know, there's certain things is just red tape and a tight end is a red tape thing. He's not going to be a tight end. He's going to be he's going to be Trevor Lawrence's backup quarterback. Oh man. Same mm -hmm. offense he ran That's in college. Yeah, you, heard, you heard it here first on the SBS edge. Why you didn't text me that, man? You got me. You you, you should prepare me for that, man. <laughs> Whoa. Oh, man. Sometimes you can't get caught up with titles. I'm looking you know? at I'm, you. I'm, you got me. You got me looking at the wrong thing, man. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And and also, you know, like I said, you can. Handle John, is this your son? This your son sitting right here? That's your boy? <laughs> like um you know like uh you can't you can't get held up on titles and sometimes with rosters having to fit a certain way he he may be used as a as a like a tool in different areas one mm -hmm. he may line up at fullback one time and definitely a decoy you know if you, they, put, if you, if you put him on there there's so many places to put him and and I'm like I said, you could it's totally opinionated. I'm on the line 50-50. I don't think personally any respectable NFL player is gonna let somebody walk in and be a motivational guy in the locker room. Those True. guys are for when you you don't talk in the NFL locker room unless you're you got major numbers out on that field. They're not just gonna listen to anybody. So that that's that's just hearsay. They're not gonna he's not gonna be a locker room guy. Or nothing like that. So why not just cut right to it, Patrick, and bring him on as a coach? Why not cut right to it and bring him on as be, as, be, as a quarterback coach? Well, because uh, he's thirty two years old, he's in shape. His college coach. Sometimes it's not what you know; it's who you know. His mm -hmm. college coach. He was extremely, extremely yeah. successful with Urban Meyer. Urban Meyer may have some t some things planned for him. You know, that's that's beyond me to say they're they're better football minds than I am. Yeah. But you know, like <laughs> yeah, like yeah, Orlando. Terry Terry said that he had a rough outing in Denver, and I, I really, really remember the total opposite. He came into a Denver team that had four wins. They were they they were losing, they had a losing. He he went on the six game winning streak and threw a, a winning touchdown pass. In a playoff. Okay. Game. Let's talk about after, after that, after that. Okay. I hear you. Well, <laughs> well, good. Look, 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 look. Yeah. Well, I think, but but to my understanding, in Denver, John Elway didn't want any parts of him, though, right? John Elway didn't really want no to he have to sign off on him with that, right? Well, we we gotta we have to remember. I think it was a week ago the NFL put out the greatest fifty players of all time. Peyton Manning was number one. He came there when Tim Tebow had that great playoff run, and then the next year, Peyton Manning was there, the greatest quarterback of all time to what the NFL says. So, yeah. you know, when he comes in, you're going to be a backup guy. 
no matter what. So there were some things that happened, but he's had some success in that league. He's had some success with Urban Meyer. He he can he may be able to come in and help Trevor Lawrence get acclimated to the NFL. I don't know what the exact thing is, but I don't want anybody to think that this 32-year-old guy who hasn't played an active game in nine years is going to line up at tight end and block somebody. Come on. Right. <laughs> right. That, Very good. What, what, what coach no. would put him at tight end? He's, I believe he's, I believe he's like 230 pounds. You know, yeah. we just saw, we just saw in the in the in the NFL draft, they got six five, 320 pound guys running four fives now. So I don't, I don't think he'll ever line up at tight end. I, I don't think a coach could could do that and keep his job. Yeah, yeah. Wow. With that, John, uh, apple don't fall too far from the tree. My guy, I can appreciate that, Patrick. I can definitely appreciate that insight. John, uh, what do you want to add to this concept uh, with Tim Tebow uh, and even basically what Patrick said about, hey, that's Urban Meyer, you know, uh, pad in the pocket, meaning, hey, I want to have a little bit more support here by bringing this guy in in an active capacity. Well, you know, Urban Meyer has never been a coach that has – uh, really developed quarterbacks in the eyes of an NFL scheme. You know, his quarterbacks can run Braxton Miller. Uh, what was Jay? What, what Terry? What JT, uh, JT Barrett. Barrett? You know, you know, uh, he know the Ohio State guys. Yeah, you know, <laughs> I mean, I mean, so who knows what is. Urban Meyer going to change everything that he's done in football, the way he attacks you, and he was an offensive guy. Is he going to change and be a normal every like every NFL team, or is he going to do something different? You know, maybe, you know, Patrick brings up a good point, but here's what I think. When I was a young man, the NFL played from September until Christmas. Oh. You didn't hear nothing about them again till training camp started in August. The NFL has done one of the great PR jobs in the history of television and media by being relevant every day. Every day. Every day, you got to come up with something new that sells. to get your ass on TV. That sells. That sells. Well, yeah. You know, and that's good for business in the state of Florida too, because it is oh yeah you know, where they saw the success now, at. Now, first of all, Urban Meyer bought a house in Jacksonville, three doors from Tim Tebow. Wow, that's where he's, that's where he's going to live. Okay, wow. So, you know, you just you just don't know because these guys, they you know. Damn, Tim and Tim and Herb can stay in the same neighborhood. Either, yeah. either somebody's slumming or somebody else got some bread I didn't know about. Tim well, Tebow, let's not forget, he's been very successful now. Come on, come from a good background. Successful. You know, from you just want to talk about does he warrant the the talk? You just go from what anything on TV is. You follow the money. He's been oh, yeah. extremely popular. This is a two time national championship. He's won the Heisman. He's one of the most popular guys. In the state of Florida, Lindsey, he can run for governor. He could run he's for the, governor. He's the Christian far right golden boy. I can Forever. just I can just imagine how many speaking engagements he gets and the, and, and the chatter he's, a, he's he's rolled up in doing that. And with that being said, he is a, a speaker. He does have a business, he is a speaker. Right. And he's been extremely successful on ESPN. He's made millions of dollars from just being a talk guy on ESPN. I think he was on. He was on Fox too, a little bit. They was bringing him oh, on. Yeah. There. He's been on oh, oh, yeah, he had a Fox game going on too. A Fox he's game. A freelance. He's a freelance analyst. He he's mm -hmm. got it. That boy got it going. He, he has. Tebow. He has been since he was a sophomore in college. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's why it was so easy for him to play baseball. They were like Tim Tebow, still, go ahead. Doesn't he still own the record for being the only true sophomore that won the Heisman? I think that's a record. I don't think. I okay. think it's Heisman of all time. Well, you heard it here on the SBS Edge. I want to thank uh, uh, Patrick for taking it there, John, for adding to that, and Terry, your point, too. And, again, the question was, is the NFL criticism warranted? And we got a, some excellent feedback. So I can appreciate 
what you guys share with that. That's a good thing going. Uh, again, I want to shout out our sponsor, Horatio Williams Foundation, as well as Dick Sporting Good and Gilead Science. And also shout out to uh, the Streets of Talking Podcast Network and all those who are listening to us throughout the SWAC, uh, throughout the country and uh, throughout the world. As a matter of fact, we got a global reach right now. So go on to somebody else who can uh, kind of be a lightning rod, if you will. And this is tough, man. This is kind of like how I feel about Master P. Wasn't really big on his music, but I love what he was about, you know. So with that being said, we're going to talk about Russell Westbrook. What's my beef with Russell? I don't know. Russell probably would be one of my best friends, but up until now, he just ain't. However, I cannot deny his accomplishments. So I'll start with this in general. And, Patrick, you made a really good point, I think, last week when we talked about uh, when they were talking about the top guards and how I felt that Isaiah was being slighted. And you did bring up the fact that Isaiah was not turnover free. There was a huge turnover that he had at one point that pretty much cost potentially, you know, a deep playoff run or a championship. But my question is simply put, will Russell Westbrook's triple double record be broken? And mind you, we probably said at one point, John, that Oscar Robinson's uh, record would never be broken. So I pose this question to you, Terry. And of course I moved to the Rutherfords. What do you think about the fact, is it possible that this newly minted Russell Westbrook triple double record uh, can actually be broken. I would probably say, with the age, I would probably say Luca. Luca is probably the closest guy, just because he's he's doing so it. Young. Mm -hmm. He's so young, and he's been doing it so frequently, like at, at a young age again. Like I mean, he's scoring like crazy. I mean, he's scoring like crazy. And the one thing about Luca, though, he's his uh, his usage rate is is really high. So he's always gonna have the ball in his hand. He's mm -hmm. always gonna make the decision. Um, they kind of, I mean, I would say right now the Mavericks' offense is similar to how Harden's was in Houston, but they actually have a center. They have some big guys. It's not like PJ Tucker running center, but I mean, the whole point is to get Luca surrounded by shooters, play off of Luca's penetration, like. The, I, all I hear is assist and rebound. And Luca's always around the rim, you know, whether it's just getting his own rebound or a defensive rebound. So all I hear is stats on stats on stats. I mean, passing the ball, scoring the ball. Like the Mavericks are a Luca. Like they are a Luca. Like, mm -hmm. so I mean, if Luca doesn't. It will be for the immediate future, too. Exactly. Unless he gets, you know, like Levine, but, or like a, some guy, you know, a guy that may be looking to go somewhere else in the future. I mean, I see his stats staying the same. I, I really don't see them changing at all. I see him kind of similar to James Harden, just the way that how they play and how their their points, uh, their their responsibility, their points responsibility is is so crazy high. Like Luca will have a game where he scores thirty and twenty and may get fifteen rebounds. And so I mean, I, that's the only person I see at the age he's at and at the pace that he's going. That's the only person I really see touching Russell Westbrook in the future. In that I record. think that's something to keep in mind, um, especially uh, with what we saw with Dirk Nowinski in the sense that, you know, the, the Mavs, they don't want to change coaches. They don't want to change players. Yeah. They get their player. They kind of lock in on him. So if you look at Luka being so young, was he 19 right now? And the potential, if you don't get kicked out of the league for technical fouls, that's another conversation <laughs> for himself. He has it. So I pose this question. I'll start with you, John, from a historical reference. Uh, for some reason, you are our, our historical uh, buff, you know, on the show right now. But think about, you know, what? How does it feel for you as as, as a connoisseur of the game to see uh, Big O's uh, triple double record broken? And at one point, at what point over these last years did you see that there was a possibility it can happen, or did you even fathom that this could happen? Well, yeah, I mean, it, listen. You know, records are made to be broken, and and you know the 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 old guard will tell you that. You know, things change, and and the way that you way that they play the game, and uh, and just everything about it. Uh, you know, I was talking to Patrick the other day about the, you know, the evolution of of the athlete, and you know, listen, there's gonna there's some kid that's out on a court right now, whether it be in California or New York City, that, that's that's hoisting up shots that 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 we don't even know about that that's going to be Russell Westbrook ten years from now or twelve years from now, and I'm all for it. Uh, you know, I'm not the type of person that uh, uh, doesn't want to change. You know, I I like I like to get up every morning. 
And the first thing I want to do is learn something and learn something new. So, no, that doesn't, that, it, you know, I mean, Oscar was a great player and, and Russell is a great player and records are mean to be broken and they will, they will always be broken. I, I, I only think there's one record in all of sports that will never be broken. And I think that Joe DiMaggio's 56th straight game hitting streak. But all other records. Wow. Young, wow. Even, even Wilt? You don't think Wilt? You think Wilt's going to be beat? What's that? You think Wilt Chamberlain's 100-point game is going to be beat in the future? Okay. Someday, of course. Yeah, Kobe could have did it if they would have let him play the fourth quarter. Yeah, Kobe you know, would have, yeah. He got 65 shots, of course. <laughs> in the right position. So, so let, me, let me ask you this. Young, the pitchers don't. They don't. They don't play as many games as Cy Young. I don't think they'll ever. I don't yeah. think they'll ever be. You know, but, yeah, I mean, the point is that you know, I mean, it, it's records are made to be broken. Yeah, John. And, let me ask you this before I go to Patrick. Uh, can we argue that an asterisk kid could go by Russell Westbrook's record because though he's not a great three point shooter, Big O didn't have a three point line. So you add the added benefit of how many additional points. He may have gotten with the three-point line being there compared to Big O not having one, Oscar Robinson not having one, that is? Well, I'll, I'll, I'll answer that question by my good friend Dan Fife. That's great. Okay. Uh, you know, his son Dane scores, you know, 50-some points at, at Clarkson one night. And Mick McKay from the free breast interviews his dad. His dad says, well, he that's not the record. The record's 63. I got it. And there was no three-point line. So, okay. You know, uh, no, I don't think you should put an asterisk. You know, rules change. And, and it's and not his fault. Change, but the record book, you know, I mean, anybody that uh, watches it knows. And, no, I don't think you should put an asterisk. Great. I'll go to you, Patrick, and I'll, I'll lead with this. We saw it with the big three. The uh, implementation of the four point, the four point shot, and I mean, you know, looking here, sitting right here, you know, a, a week or so after Oscar Robertson's record be broken, we have to have this mindset that things can change. If the NBA instituted something like a four point play, or this Elon ending that had something additional, what do you think that should do? Should it be an adjustment across the board for criteria to meet these records? Because if you put a four point play in there, or added some other stat that contributed more to a rebound, or some other kind of pat stat pattern do you think that still should change you know uh what should be considered uh, you know valid breaking of a record if that makes any sense uh well the four point play kind of already exists doesn't it well i guess if you shoot a three pointer but i was talking about the four point basket for the most part i think that'd be ridiculous personally i would never yeah. want to see that but um, you know, the only four-point play that should happen is like Steph Curry and James Harden when they get fouled at three-point line and sink it and then they get a free throw. They make it. And that's, so I guess that's part of the game right now. So what do you think overall? Do you see uh, Russell Westbrook's record being broken? Yeah, of course. Well, yeah. Give me, a time, give me a potential timeline if that's fair to ask. I, I don't think you can call it a timeline. It could be 20 years. It could be 30 years. It could be 40. You never know. But, you know, me and my dad – we we're talking about the other day the evolution of man and Jesse Owens in the 30s 36 Olympics in the 36 Olympics broke all these records and that's what a high school kid runs in track now dang wow uh, well it was uh in the 80s where Michael Jordan jumped from the free throw line now when I was in the eighth grade a kid named Alan Lavender whose brother played at Michigan State guess Antonio guess yeah yeah mm -hmm. He uh he he jumped from the free throw line like it was nothing, you know. There's so many people that can jump from the free throw line now, you know. So naturally, there's just men get stronger, faster, and there's more. There's evolution on the way you work out, the way you eat. All these things are happening with technology, plus with with doctors and 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 how you nutrition yourself. LeBron James spends two million dollars on his body a year. That didn't exist five years ago. And he's not like them cats that was smoking beer, smoking cigarettes, and drinking beer. Right. <laughs> one of the greatest basketball players, one of the greatest basketball players from the Detroit area, Rudy Tomjanovich, who's going in the, hall who's of fame, going in the Basketball Hall of Fame, 
used to walk around with luckies in his in his arm and and, and some snops and drank liquor and played basketball outside and smoke cigarettes all day long, you know, and that there's, you know, there's the legendary story of like uh, Joe Namath, you know, you know, eating chocolate and stuff during tobacco, the, chewing tobacco, tobacco, chewing tobacco and stuff during the game. And yeah, some dip to during the game. His, to show his line and to show his people that, you know, he wasn't nervous, you know, and there, there's so many things, but I, I think that, that there's another side to it. You know, I'm ashamed that we're a part of a culture that a guy gets a, a triple double, but he's 32 and 38. Come and on, talk like, about that then. They're talk like, not, are they even like coming towards the playoffs? Like, we're talking about one of the worst teams in the NBA. You know, who cares about records when it doesn't translate to wins? This is a, this is we respect wins and championships, and this guy's been so far away from them that it doesn't even make sense. He had Paul George in a ridiculous team in OKC and got put out in the first round three years in a row and had a triple-double two of those years. He averaged a triple-double two of those years and got put out in the first round of the playoffs. So, like, if it doesn't translate to wins, I don't really think it's really oriented to even talk about it. I mean, uh, that's and, fair. That's uh, fair. And, 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 and Terry, I know you want, may want to share something, but I just want to say – you make an excellent point, Patrick, because it's almost like we're doing what we said we didn't want to happen, and we're highlighting individual play, even though a triple-double means you got some assist in there, whatever, whatnot. But, right, you know, it's almost like you're not allowed to talk about record and accomplishments within the same breath. Terry, did you want to share something with that? Yeah, I just I just felt, you know, I was a little on the other side because, I mean, Russell Westbrook coming in um, ever since that trade, and, like, his situation is really weird. Because I, I'm a big fan of wins over stats. Like, that's always been me. That's always been team player, you know, myself. I don't care if I have 50, we lose, I'm upset. You know, that's always been me. But, I mean, the way that Westbrook has really transformed that Wizards team, in the beginning, when he got traded with John Wall, I thought that was the best situation Russell Westbrook could have. He goes to a team, they're not doing so well, they have not been good. You know, they've been kind of beat down, broken down the last few years. He can go there, play hard, and help get those hardworking wins, catch some good teams, slip in some nights, and get wins. They didn't start off too well. They were losing. They were the worst team in the league, the Pistons, Cavs. All these teams are doing better than them. I knew at some point when you're playing with a guy like Bradley Beal next to you and you're Russell Westbrook, you're that all-star, that MVP, that caliber player, like – at some point, I knew that they were going to turn it around, and I feel like Russell Westbrook had a big part in that because even when games where Beal was out and Beal had to take games off because he was injured or needed a few nights off, Russell really brought those guys going, and he did get those triple-doubles. Sometimes he wouldn't, like like last night, he didn't win. Like when they played the Hawks, they didn't win. But even though Russell played hard, you can still see the team playing well. You can see it. But they, he has been a victim where he, it does seem like stat chasing. It does seem like he is trying to go get that assist that may win the game when he should take the bucket and put them in a better situation. There have been times where he doesn't play well with Kevin Durant, where he takes the shot that where we know the ball should be in Kevin Durant's hands. And Paul George and him did not do so well together. But, I mean, at the same time, Russell, he's, he's doing something where – we can't critique him. He plays hard every night. That's something about Westbrook that I mean, Coach Jones go uh, back and forth about. Russell plays hard every night. We can't take that away from him. But there are times where he does get into that stat chasing conversation. Luca, James Harden, guys who haven't really won much yet. Luca's still young, but Harden who hasn't won anything yet. But it always seems like Russell Westbrook's accomplishments always get kind of trampled over or critique the most, but I don't see James Harden. Everyone talks about Harden's success, averaging 30 in the whole season, all these different talks, but I don't see Harden really getting critiqued as much as Westbrook. I just thought I'd just mm. put that out there. I don't really see the talk going both ways, but Westbrook gets a lot of the talk, though. Patrick, I see you leaning in like you're about to hit the buzzer on Family Feud. Yeah, Terry, you said several times that they they turned it around. It's, is it fair to say when you're under 500, you turned it around? That's fair to say. 
Yeah, but they but they in that playing game. It, it, I mean, for the Wizards to be in the playing game, you probably had to smack me and say that I'm dreaming because I'm like the Wizards were garbage. I, I was I did not think they were gonna be in this. Last I thought they were year, gonna be able to get K Cunningham. Last year they won 25 games. This year they won 32. That's true. I mean, the East did get better this year. I would say that the East got better, but and, and the, there's instead of eight teams going to the playoffs, they they have a ten you all the way to ten seed playing game. That's so, true. I mean, everybody. You gets want, a you want to talk about that, but let me ask this question for both you guys, and uh, you can <laughs> chime in as well, John. Before we transition, we could talk about stat stuff, but in all fairness to Russell in this regard. Does the media, not referring to ourselves, but when you talk about the NBA media, when they highlight these things, are they creating an environment for that where he's just going out playing hard every day? You know, we talk about him not being a pure shooter, but somehow he wills himself to a point to get this. But you hear this narrative, you know, on TNT, you hear this narrative uh, after, you know, during the games with the talking heads. What, what role does the media play in creating this to make us aware of the fact that Russell's closing in on, you know, uh, Oscar Robertson's record, even though he's not campaigning and champagning on his own for it. You know, what do you think, Patrick? Well, let me ask, let me pose a question to you and Terry, and it's an easy question, yes or no. Have you, did you see a game in OKC where Steven Adams, when the ball went up and the rebound came down, did you yeah. see Steven Adams clear people <laughs> out and let Russell Westbrook come get it? That, that's that's the Brett for our Reggie White fall down. It happens. You know, it happened with that. that that's it, the it happened a lot. Yeah, it, it, it happens right. a lot. But I think that's in happening. Today's, in today's NBA, you have to play for a terrible team, and they're letting you pad the stats. That's as simple as that. And, and he, we're having conversations with, uh, Shannon Sharp and Skip Bayless that he's the number two point guard of all time. I, I thought I thought you were signing off on that when you was quick to say he had the turnover. Absolutely not. How how could he be the second best point guard of all time when Steph Curry is the point guard on the roster? Well, I didn't know, and to be honest, I lost a little sleep over that last week, Patrick. So Absolutely. I'm going to get that up, okay, that, so that is the most I can name two <laughs> point guards better than him. But to that point, to that point, I don't want to belabor because we're going to get to talking about somebody you mentioned a second ago, Terry. But to that point, look how we're having this discussion. And I think it's something interesting that somehow it becomes a media show that even – I thought it was blasphemous even to mention it like that. Yeah, you got a triple-double. But I was like, what? And then even Isaiah was an afterthought. He was like they were bringing him in after number five or whatever or not. But I think it fits into a narrative. Whether uh and there's we're, and we're a stat driven, uh, uh athletic uh you know uh a society right now and maybe because there's no other stories and there's not a story about them winning they can look at that. I don't want us to beat that up to a point, but these are some good points you guys are making. Something we probably can come back to and something we can also keep an eye on too as far as how things have transitioned from what uh John would turn on the TV and see with Big O, you know, scoring at without the three point line to where we are right now. But staying with a name you mentioned earlier, that's really a great segue, Terry. When we talk about who may be the one to potentially break this record, if you're talking about a 19 year old who may dare play the type of uh career that LeBron James has 18 to 20 seasons, my question though, what's up with Luca? What is up with Luca leading the league in technical fouls, having to sit out a game? And, you know, I'm kind of bothered by a little bit because it's almost like, you know, the, the arrogance and maybe the entitlement that you're still coming in early on in this league and you're arguing with the refs. You ain't getting texts because you're going to other players. I mean, you're arguing with the establishment and self. And maybe I'll throw another little side, you know, conversation that we can come back to of time. You know, what's up with, uh, you know, uh, 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 LaMelo, uh, you know, and, and snatching away from the ref. That's another one, too. But let's start with Luca. Uh, let me ask you this, uh, John. What do you think about Luca leading the league in text? Is it because they're trying to set him up to be the face of the league that he has this opportunity to do it, or is it just a bad look overall, or just a spoiled kid that's overwhelmed with what's happening with NBA basketball? Well, obviously, he doesn't know how to communicate his frustrations with the stripes. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, for years, and I came in both on the referee side and the coach side, you know, there's a golden word starts with an F you're not supposed to use. And, you know, it, it goes automatically, you're out. So someone just needs to teach the young man how to communicate. 
Well, uh, per Perkins say he should start cursing in Italian. You know, well, that's, that's, Italian. That's, <laughs> that's exactly that's exactly right. And you know, another thing too is that uh, he's got to learn how to toughen up probably a little bit. They, uh, you know, they when they want to, uh, you put an athlete on them, it's gonna make them hard make him work harder than he usually does. It's going to be a challenge for him. And he, he might, you know, have a little crybaby in him too. So you need to get your communication uh, skills and uh, you need to go back to junior high and go on the playground yeah. uh, at lunchtime and, and, and learn how to learn how to uh, deal with the bullies. So, you know, learn those two things and go play basketball, yeah. young man. Uh, Patrick, let me ask you this. Did you see – would you see uh, Luca, Luca throwing that uh, shot to the groin area to a player other than Colin Sexton, somebody who's smaller than him, or or, or a vet? Could you see that happening? No. Could you see that happening to, to him with the Boogie Cousins or uh, – let me see uh, – Montrez Harrell? Or somebody no like that? Could you see that happening? No way. No, no way. way at all. No way at all. Yeah, we know uh, how to pick some. You know those those guys that we know that that's like that. They pick who they know they can get it away with. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's unfortunate. You know, I guess you could say hats off to Colin Sexton, and I'll go to you, Terry, on this and this new NBA, if you will. For you know, he didn't become the story. But you know, so many of them vet guys like dog. It was on site, like dog. We it's going <laughs> down. And to be honest, not that I'm advocating for violence, but when was the last time we saw a fight in the NBA? You know what I'm saying? I'm talking. I said a fight. I didn't say no malice in the palace. Okay, then that's what it took. And how far do we got to go back for that? And and technically, <laughs> yeah. And that was a fight. So with that being said, those guys are all transitioning out the NBA for the most part. But you don't see no 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 blows being thrown. So Terry, what do you think? What do you think about what's going on with your guy Luca? You kind of brought him up when we were talking about him having this possibility of being a record breaker in the NBA, but yet and still the records he break he breaking the wrong records. He's like he's either what probably the youngest guy to get the most texts and get thrown out of game, or, or do you think he's uh, there's some pressure going on to Pat, to John's point that there's some pressure that he's having difficulty in and being able to overcome and deal with. Well, I think it's a lot of factors when it comes to it. Um, one is the fact that, you know, Luca is a younger player. Um, you know, he's still learning how to, you know, communicate, like John said. And I think that's really key. I mean, when you're in the league, I don't know how referees are acting in, you know, in the league that he played in prior to the NBA. But, I mean, over here, they're a lot more strict on that. Um, I've always been taught growing up to just play, don't talk to the referee. I mean, I know nowadays you're allowed to ask them questions, but to a certain extent, it's like, do you not want to you when you hear their answer, you fire back with something else that, you know, is not a part of what the referee said you can do. And also you got to know your refs. You know, you got to know, am I allowed to ask those questions? Some will answer you, period. Some will just ignore you, flat out ignore you. But in the NBA, they're a little more lenient with that. And I and I think Luca has to understand that when you play the foul game, you know, Harden has been a victim to playing the foul game. Trey Young has been playing the foul game. When you're going to the basket expecting to get free throws, that's always a problem because then you don't get the call and it, and it puts you out of your game, you know, and it messes with your mindset coming in. You know, you're like, oh, I got, I got to get these foul. I got to get these free throws. That's not how you play a game. You know, that, that's not really how you play, but he he's so – he it's a it's like a part of his game. I got to get these. It's almost he like he's – yeah. he, he, like He's, he's, he's found a, a glitch in the matrix and he's exploiting that. So let me see this in the interest of time, guys. Uh, I, I want to jump to one of our last topics, which is the NBA playing tournament. And what I really want to do, not necessarily a rapid fire, because I want to better get this in, but just really kind of get your guys, you know, take on this NBA playing tournament, yay or nay. And also I want to shout out one of our uh, most uh, supportive followers, and that is Aaron Mays. Aaron is always tuning in. Uh, he's so supportive of the crew. He always has something positive to say. So, Aaron, we appreciate uh, your support of the SBS Edge podcast, and we know you're out there listening. Uh, you know, this playing tournament, which is going to take place uh, next week, we're talking about uh, between Tuesday and Friday, uh, May 18th to the 21st. Now, maybe I have issue with the playing tournament because of my concern that maybe a team – there you go, Orlando, he's on it, man – a team that I may like 
uh, may run the risk uh, of not being able to make it. But then there's one thing I looked at in some research that I did that makes all the sense in the world of why we having that. It's the State Farm playing tournament. How much money the State Farm put on the table? Again, same people who put together that pre-Final Four. You know how before the NBA, uh, NCAA season we have those Blue Bloods, we have Michigan State, Kansas, Kentucky, and Duke playing, sponsored by State Farm. So I think this, even though they, they voted on this a year ago, you know, my thing is, is it good for basketball or is this more of a business opportunity for them to kind of make up for things that were lost? I'll start with you, Terry, and I'll go to John and Patrick. What do you think? I think I think it's good for basketball on one side of the conference, <laughs> and that's the Western Conference. You know, you got teams like, you know, the Warriors, the Lakers right now, um, San Antonio Spurs, and the Memphis Grizzlies, teams that have given that have given those top teams some trouble. I would say the Grizzlies probably wouldn't be in this situation if Ja and Jaron Jackson and their key guys may have not been banged up. I mean, the Warriors, if Clay's there, are they in there? Are, are they not in the playing game? Is someone else in their spot? Uh, LeBron, he's coming back. Are the Lakers, you know, would they be in that playing spot? So, I mean, it gives these teams – you know, a chance to, you know, play it gives the fans something to watch. There are a ton of teams who are in that playing game that fans want to see play up against each other and earn the right to make the playoffs. It makes it more competitive. There has been a lot of talk in the NBA about making regular season games more competitive, you know, eliminating that load management and, uh, you know, players just taking days off and not, you know, wanting to really play. That's, that's, a that's a good point. That's a big thing. You, know? point. You, take, you, you, you don't want to get caught in that playing game, so you, we get yeah. you out to play. I like that. That's a very good point. And, and you know, it, it gives fans, you know, a big thing that fans did have tr have a problem with is going to a game and not seeing their favorite star. That I mean, I would be a little upset too, but yeah. at the same time, you know, teams were trying to win, but this definitely puts a lot of pressure on, on teams. That's why we're seeing a ton of playoff basketball towards the end of this season. Like, that Portland Trailblazer and Jazz game last night, I stayed up and watched the whole thing because I'm like, Portland is playing playoff basketball. I'm seeing Dame hit big time shots. Like we're starting to see these teams get in that playoff mode because they want to. They don't want to play in that playing game. Yeah, you're right. I like that. So you made some excellent points. You've kind of educated me to a perspective too. Uh, John, I'll start with you. Uh, excuse me, Patrick. I'll start with you, and we'll finish with John on this one. Okay. Um, for the playing game being named after them. Uh, State Farm spends over a billion dollars a year just in advertising. And that was a billion with a B, to be sure. A billion with a B. Yes, they wow. do. Um, it may even be closer to two billion, but they spend that much money a year in advertising. And then for my uh, opinion on the playing game, I think it's absolutely ridiculous. I think it's really? absolutely pointless to exist because they play 72 games here. It's not like last year where they, they had, you know, maybe 15 games left or 20 games left and certain teams were in the hunt, and then they only let those certain teams that were in the hunt come to the bubble, get a couple warm-up games, and then play it out for a title. It's totally different than, than, that, than that. There's been 72 games played here. Mm -hmm. They've been playing this game for 50 years, 60, 70 years now. Like, if, if you play 72 games, you know – who deserves to go and who doesn't? These playoff games is just, they're just another, just playing games are just another way to advertise and make some more money than what they already did, I guess. I don't know. So technically there's a play-in game. What is the play-in game in the 72-game season? Does that, the play-in, the 72-game season is ended and then the play-in game is a precursor to the playoffs. So, okay, I get that. Yeah, I get well, that. I need a play-in game. They play 72 games. Don't you know? We're trying to get that money, dog. Absolutely. <laughs> John, what do you think about the plan game? Did you ever see this day coming? Were you gonna have a plan before the plan? No, I, I, I think it's all. I think it's due to them trying to experiment. Uh, I think that the viewership uh, overall it, this season is down uh, like the third, and I mean it's really taking a hit. So when that happens. Uh, State Farm and Geico and uh, Budweiser and the rest of them are saying, "Hey, look it, we're not paying what we paid." So they're they're trying to experiment. I, there's even talk about some kind of preseason, you know, one and done tournament. 
you know, going to one place and having a one and done tournament. Mm -hmm. So they're, they're trying to experiment, but Patrick's right. You know, it's just like football going from 16 games to 17 games. These owners, man, they're going to, you know, they're going to squeeze, they're going to squeeze, 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 and squeeze money. And, and uh, that's what this is all about. Like Orlando uh, says on a weekly basis, it, it's entertainment. Yeah. And, yeah. And, it, and it has a value to it. And the value is how much these guys are willing to pay for that three, four minute com commercial time. Translates into money in the owners. It translates into salaries to the players. Yeah. So they're just, they're just trying to figure out yeah. some way to, to stay relevant and keep the money flowing. Yeah, yeah. And I think the challenge is for us purists, you know, we have to battle with that. But it's also that's the price you got to pay. So with well, that, gonna... if you want purists, probably go watch a good high school team play. There you go. You, you can't <laughs> go wrong with that. But I want to say I thank you guys. Uh, we got Terry McCord Jr. We got John and Patrick Rutherford. We got uh, my guy, Coach Orlando Watkins, behind uh, keeping us on time. I want to thank Horatio Williams Foundation, Gilead Sciences, as well as Dick Sporting Good. And a uh, shout out to the Streets of Talking Podcast Network, Don Houston and Clarence Pabor. I want to thank you guys. Uh, great show. Uh, keep an eye on us, and we'll be back next week with some more information for you. And uh, have a good time. This is SBS Edge, and we're out. That's a thumbnail, too, Lindsay. That's a thumbnail? Oh, that's the one right there? For, for, for the YouTube channel. Well, you put it up there. Okay, we'll get it. We're getting ready to shut down in a second. I don't know. Orlando may have stepped away because we're still live. So uh, don't don't give out no phone numbers or don't say where you were <laughs> last night. You know? Hey, you, know you know, every every great YouTube channel has a merch line. I feel you with that. Oh, oh everything cool? We still live right now. Yeah, my screen just completely froze. Your screen, screen froze? Okay, so we're going to just uh, – we're all going to uh, just – I'm gonna try to get back in and end it. I mean, the whole thing just dipped. That's okay. Hey, Lindsay, did you see what your what your guy Mel Tucker did? Oh, his last. Uh, well, hold on for one second, though. Hold on for one second.